I'm so glad you're joining us today for what is now the second installment in a brand new series called Hidden in Plain Sight. It's just two parts. We started last week. We looked at the story of Moses and bringing water from the rock. This week, we're looking at the story of Esther. Both of these messages really show us the shadow of the cross as it lies across the Old Testament. As we get started, would you just take a moment, pray with me now. Father, I just want to thank you for your incredible love. You are so good to us. This season of Lent is such a, a perfect time to get focused on Christ, to, to think about creating that space in our life for you to have full and complete access, to be able to do some house cleaning and to be able to do in our life those things that we can't do for ourselves. I'm praying that that's what you're going to do and more today. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Esther took place about 2,500 years ago in Persia, which is modern-day Iran. It's truly one of the most neglected books in the Bible. Did you know that there were no commentaries written about the book of Esther in the first 700 years of the church? Famous theologians like John Calvin never preached from it. Martin Luther just came out and said he hated the book of Esther. In fact, he once said this, I am so great an enemy to the second book of Maccabees and to Esther that I wish they had not come to us at all, for they have too many heathen unnaturalities. Well, you know, over the years, a lot of believers have struggled with understanding the book of Esther because it's so different from the rest of the Bible. Like one biggie, did you know the book of Esther never mentions God? In addition, no one prays, there's no miracles, and there's no prophecy. There isn't even a mention of heaven or hell. And the book is never quoted or referenced in any other place in Scripture. In short, it doesn't seem to be a very religious book other than mentioning fasting. It's made people wonder, why is this book even in the Bible in the first place? You should also know there are three books in the Bible that are primarily about women. The book of Esther is one of them, so is the book of Ruth, and the Song of Songs that we looked at just a few weeks back. What's curious about all three of these books is they're all great stories, but none of them are easy to understand, and each of them have significant meaning that requires you to dig beneath the surface. I'll tell you right up front, the best way to look at this book is like this. The book of Esther is a historical parable, a living, breathing, real historical account, but like a parable, it's a story laid alongside another truth to help us understand that other truth even better. Now, that other truth I'm talking about is Jesus' self-sacrificing love and how he would defeat the enemy by turning his evil scheme against himself. I'm going to show you all that and more as we work our way through this book. Just like in last week's message where we saw the shadow of the cross and the story of Moses striking the rock, this story is also filled with shadows of the cross. God put these stories in Scripture so that you and I might marvel at how God's been telling the same story for all time. You see, we're all supposed to look at history and how all of history is his story. It's Jesus' story. It's the story of Christ. When we read the Bible, we read both the Old and New Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ. So let's launch into this book. If I were to summarize the book of Esther, it's about a planned holocaust. That's really the book in a nutshell. First, we're introduced to a king whose name is never given to us. Ahasuerus is not his name. That's a title, like the words czar or shah or pharaoh. There are several men in Scripture identified as Ahasuerus, and none of them are the same man. Ahasuerus meant the venerable father, because the king was kind of like a father to the nation. The book of Esther begins with his, the king and his wife, Queen Vashti, having a party. This party lasted for seven days, and on the seventh day, the king sent his servants to fetch his wife so that he could parade her beauty for all of his friends to see. Well, the queen didn't like being treated like an object, so she refused to come. This did not go over well. The king was humiliated in front of his guests because of the queen's defiance. So, the king issued a decree that the queen would never be allowed in his presence again. He would find a new queen someone who he thought was more worthy than Vashti. Well, that's where we meet Esther. Esther was one of many women who were chosen as a potential queen for the king. Now, here's how it worked. Each woman was chosen. Then when it came her turn, she would go and visit the king in the evening, then return in the morning to the care of an attendant who took care of the king's concubines and harem. Then, if the king liked that woman and called for her by name, only then would she see or would he see her again. 
So Esther would go sleep with the king and in the morning return to the group of women. If the king liked her, she would become a part of his harem. If things went really well, she'd be given the opportunity to be queen. So it's quite a Cinderella story. But that's when this story gets really interesting. The Bible says the king loved Esther more than all the other women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set a royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So Esther is made the new queen. It's at this point, though, that we're introduced to the villain in the story. This guy's name is Haman, and he's called an Agagite. Now, if you go way back to the book of Exodus, you might remember that the Amalekites attacked Israel right after they had left in their exodus from Egypt. God told Saul to kill all the Amalekites along with their king. Well, Saul thought he knew better than God, so he spared the king, a man named Agag. The Agagites are the descendants of that king. They're the descendants of the Amalekites. They got their name from the king that Saul refused to kill. So after years have passed, the Agagites still hate the Jews. Every generation, or each generation that is, passed on their bigotry to the next generation. you got to remember, no one's born a bigot. You, you have to be taught to be a bigot. Prejudice doesn't come with birth. It's something that we learn. And Haman learned his lessons well. He hated Jewish people. So when Haman saw Esther's uncle Mordecai, who he doesn't know is related to the queen, refusing to bow before him? He was so angered by this obstinate Jew that he convinced the king to wipe out all these people for their disloyalty to the throne. And the king decides to do just that. He issues a decree in the law of the Medes and the Persians, which can never be altered, and declares that all Jews must die. It's a holocaust, every bit as real as the one under Hitler in World War II. So at this point in the story, Esther has been queen for about five years. Nobody, not even the king, knew that she was Jewish. In her place of privilege, she was living a very comfortable life, insulated from the problems of her people and totally unaware of the genocide that was about to be carried out. Now, before we go any further, let's just kind of back up a minute and ask the question, was Esther, the, the orphan Esther, was she a victim or a, vict a vixen? You see, if you read Bible commentaries or have ever listened to a sermon on Esther, a lot of people try to make Esther into some kind of tramp or vixen. They act like Esther's story is just another installment in the TV show The Bachelor. That type of thinking is way off base and grossly distorts the message of Esther. Let me explain. Esther is an orphan girl. Her name literally means I am hiding, which is a pretty good description of her life for the first half of this book. She's lost her country, which is why she's living in exile in Persia in the first place. She's also tragically lost both parents. To what? We don't know. Then she loses her freedom as she's taken against her will to be a part of the royal harem. No wonder the girl wants to hide. Look at this verse. Let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all of these young, beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king, the young woman who pleases the king, be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. So Esther is among these hundreds of young virgins brought into the king's harem. There was nothing, this is nothing like the audition process for the bachelor. Ecclesiastes 2.8 goes on to say, when the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. Now notice the difference between the words used in this verse to describe the actions of the men versus the words used to describe the actions of the women. The women were brought. They were taken. They were put under the charge of men. There's no consent forms here. This was, pure and simple, an edict from the most powerful man in the world followed by its enforcement. What the women wanted is not really a factor in this story. Because the king is not asking, he's taking. Karen Jobes wrote this, very insightful. Regardless of how she felt about it or whether she cooperated, Esther was at the mercy of a ruthless pagan king just as her people were. 
the use of the passive voice is appropriate in this story, for it expresses life from the perspective of being caught up and swept along by circumstances beyond one's control. Also, keep in mind, Esther was a typical teenage girl in the Middle East in a time of extreme patriarchy. This is when only men had rights and women were treated like property. In her culture, she wouldn't have been expected to have any say in her own marriage or her future. That's just not the way it worked back then. So when she is taken with the other virgins into the harem, the chance that she would defy any of that is incredibly rare. So when preachers malign Esther's character, It's largely because they're reading this story through the lens of our culture today and not through the cultural lens of that day. One pastor, well known for his misogynistic statements, who lost his church in Seattle over it, chastised Esther for not fighting back when she could have said no. He calls her a hypocrite and worldly and a a woman who got herself into this mess. But when you judge Esther as a free woman in a free society, you misunderstand the Bible. Instead, what we see is God at work in Esther's life to redeem the bad choices of all the men that surround her. In the first part of the story, Esther is portrayed as an attractive woman, but passive in speech and actions. She was carried along in life by men who were making all the decisions for her. Esther never even speaks in the first half of this book. But in the second half, Esther's transformed from a passive character to a proactive, confident leader. In the first half of the book, Mordecai, her uncle, is most prominent. In the second half of the book, it's no longer Mordecai and Esther, but it flips and begins to describe the relationship as Esther and Mordecai. Esther goes from being a victim to being a leader. Now, here's the thing you have to keep in mind about victimization. If you oppress someone for long enough, eventually that stuff gets internalized. So many decisions are made for Esther that she begins to think that she's incapable of making good decisions for herself. So she concludes, I must not have a say in what happens to me or my body. This is what we talked about last week when we discussed learned helplessness as it related to the children of Israel. Basically, if you oppress people long enough, they begin to oppress themselves. In a word, Esther needs to be empowered. She needs to know that she has a voice and that voice matters that she can act and it will make a difference. She needs to believe that she can rise above being a victim and decide for herself what her future will be. And that's the role her uncle Mordecai plays. At first, Mordecai is the main character. He he actively resists Haman, who's the bad guy. The story is all about men having issues with another man. But to really solve this problem, Mordecai has to pass the mantle of leadership onto his niece. He has to entrust her with the things that he can't do. What Mordecai knows is if he keeps holding on to power, ultimately, what he's really doing is withholding power from her. Only when he relinquishes leadership to Esther does he really empower her. By the way, this mentorship and that empowerment that happens, it happens over time. Just as a matter of perspective, from the beginning of the the book to this point in the book, Five years have passed, so mentorship is not an overnight process. It takes years. So finally, Mordecai says to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. What Mordecai is saying is, perhaps God has placed you exactly where you are for a reason. We never know how, we never know when, God is going to call on us to be a part of his plan. God came along like a coach and tapped Esther on the shoulder and said, you're in. This is your chance. This is your moment to shine. We also have to remember, we also have to remember this, that God will act without us. Mordecai says, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Mordecai knows that God will keep his promises. The Jews will not be completely destroyed, no matter what the enemy has planned for them. It reminds me of this great quote by A.W. Tozer. He said, in the moral conflict now raging around us, whoever is on God's side is on the winning side and cannot lose. Whoever is on the other side is on the losing side and cannot win. 
In other words, if we choose to be silent when God says speak, if we choose to be disobedient when opportunity knocks, if we decide to turn a deaf ear when those who are desperate are crying out, God still will not be defeated. Someone else will respond, and someone else will be blessed, and someone else will have a great story to tell. Now, there's a certain level of fear in this for Esther. She tells Mordecai, it's been 30 days since I was last called to see the king. You see, they may be husband and wife right now, but she hasn't been with him for 30 days. Remember, the king has a harem, dozens and dozens of women at his disposal. He's not exactly what you'd call a devoted husband. And maybe he's not quite as excited or, or enamored with her as he was in the early days of their marriage. So at this point, Esther is questioning just how much influence that she's got with the king. So Mordecai says to her, his niece, Esther, the fate of the whole nation is in your hands. You didn't ask for it, but here it is. You have not been brought to this point in your life for the sake of accumulating an exquisite robe and precious gems and exotic fragrances. You've not been brought to this point in your life to become the most desirable and attractive woman in the entire kingdom. You've not been brought to this point for the reason the king thinks you have. You have been brought to this point in your life to work for justice and to spare your people a great suffering. You've been brought to this moment to fulfill God's plan. In other words, this is your Kairos moment. You are where you are for a reason. Listen to Mordecai. Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Do you know in the New Testament, there's two words for the word time. The first word is chronos, and it's the word from which we get the English word chronology. Chronology is a measurement of time, a sequence of events. So chronos is seconds, minutes, hours, and days. Chronos is calendars, schedules, and clocks. But there's another Greek word for time, and it's the word kairos. Kairos is something more like, the, it's more than just the ticking of the second hand or crossing days off a calendar. Kairos is the pregnant moment in time, the point of decision. It's a point in time when everything is aligned and you know that this is your opportunity. It's the moment where you choose between fear and faith. That's what Mordecai is talking about for such a time as this. He's talking about a Kairos moment. The New Testament tells us that the arrival of Jesus Christ into this world was a Kairos moment. The Bible says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. In other words, this is a moment that will never be repeated. It's never going to happen again, not like this. Usually, when we look back through history, we remember these pivot points, these watershed moments when some man or some woman stood up and declared that things were going to be different. I know for many people in my generation, we look back at Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech as a, as a Kairos moment, and it truly was. But you know, there was another speech that Dr. King gave the night before he was assassinated. That speech looks and sounds a lot more like Esther's Kairos moment, because the last line in that sermon was this, I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Dr. King wasn't sure if he would live to see the civil rights dream become a reality, and the truth is he did not. But nothing was going to stop him from doing God's will and using his voice and advocating for those who needed him. Now listen to Esther because she's saying something remarkably similar. She says, go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Wow. If I perish, I perish. What does that mean? It means that Esther didn't know what the outcome of her action would be. She had no guarantees about how things were going to turn out. She made her decision and left the results to God. If I perish, I perish. She says, though I may not know what will happen to me, my life isn't the most important thing, but faithfully doing what God is asking me to do is. The stakes are very high. If Esther goes before the king without being invited, she can be executed unless the king raises his golden scepter in reprieve. Now, please understand, I'm, I'm not talking about some hypothetical threat of execution. 
this is a very real possibility, historically speaking. You know, we have works of art from this period that portray the king of Persia on his throne. And one of the things you'll notice in those artworks is that there is a guard with a great big standing right beside the king, ready to execute swift judgment on anyone that the king asked him to do so. In addition, Esther also has her work cut out for her because she's got to try to convince the king to reverse an irreversible law. The Holocaust plan for her people was executed according to the law of the Persians and the Medes, which means it could not be undone. So here's what happened on the third day. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, Esther replied, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we might do what Esther asked. So long story short, Esther has to be very strategic in what she does or else Haman, the king's right-hand man, this terrible enemy, might just turn the tables on her. So if Haman is suspicious for any reason, he might use his considerable power and influence with the king against Esther. So she decides to throw a banquet that includes Haman. That way, Haman is lulled into a growing sense of confidence in his plans. You know, I read a definition of confidence that I'd never thought about before. It said this, confidence is defined as suspicions put to sleep. That's what Esther was doing. She was putting Haman's suspicions to sleep, building up his confidence in his evil plans. You see, Esther's angle is to follow God's lead and let the devil hang himself. Now, we know from what the Bible says is there's a first banquet and then there's a second. And between those two banquets, Haman had a gallows built. His intent was to hang Mordecai from it ASAP. Esther allows Haman to build his gallows that everyone knows is for Mordecai, and she will trust God to spring that trap. And in the end, that's exactly what happened. Esther, at just the right time, tells the king about Haman's deception, and Haman ends up being executed on his own gallows. Now, to undo the king's ruling to kill the Jews, since it was written in the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which could not be altered or undone, it would have to be preempted. So the king issues a new decree that allowed the Jews to band together and protect themselves. So to undo an irreversible law, a new law has to be put in place that supersedes the old one, a law that guarantees protection, a law that says the Jews don't have to die. And that's what happened. And that's how Esther saved her people. But like I said, you know, there's more to this story than meets the eye, because this is not just the story of a woman who saved her people. Ultimately, it points to a greater reality of how Christ would save the world. So let's look at this final point. I call it a historical parable, finding his story in history. Listen to this. Mordecai wrote all this down and sent copies to the Jews in, king, in all King Xerxes' provinces, regardless of distance, calling for an annual celebration on the 14th and 15th days of Adar as the occasion when Jews got relief from their enemies the month in which their sorrow turned to joy. Morning, summer salted into a holiday for parties and fun and laughter, the sending and receiving of presents and of giving gifts to the poor. And they did it. What started then became a tradition. Now, did you know that to this day, Jewish people celebrate the story of Esther in what's called the Feast of Purim? They set aside two days every year just to celebrate. During this time, they publicly read the story of Esther in the synagogue. All the kids who come to synagogue come with their drums and their horns. And whenever the name of Haman is read in the story, they blow those horns and they pound on those drums, booing and hissing to drown out this bad guy's name. The people eat, they drink, they exchange gifts, much like what we do at Christmas. All of this in remembrance of a young girl named Esther who saved the people from certain death. It seems that God never wants his people to forget this story. The question is why? Why is this story so important? I already mentioned to you that God's name is never even mentioned in this book. Throughout history, a lot of people didn't even like the book of Esther. 
Some well-known Christians in history ignored it and refused to preach from it. But like I said, this book is more than just the story of a heroic and brave woman. It's a story of a Savior. This is why God wants his people to retell this story every year. His hope is that one day they too might make that connection. So, S, so, so let me just kind of point out the parallels between the Esther story and the Jesus story. First is this, the law of the Medes and the Persians versus the law of sin and death. We're told in the Bible and in history that the law of the Medes and the Persians could not be altered. Their laws were irreversible. Once it was set, it was set in stone, could never be undone. Even the book of Esther mentions this fact. It says, for no document written in the king's name, sealed with his ring, can be revoked. So in Esther's story, the question is, what can be done to alter an unalterable law? Well, the answer is a new law must be written that supersedes the old law. When a law can't be undone, a new law must be written that in effect overrides it. This particular element in the story is a reminder of what the book of Romans calls the law of sin and death. Paul wrote this, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So think about it. We were all under the old law of sin and death. We were born sinners, and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We were all separated from God. That law cannot be undone. It's just a fact of life. Sin separates us from God. But when Christ came, his death and resurrection established a new law. The old law is still in effect, but the new law of life in Christ counteracts the effects of the law of sin and death for all those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. The law of the spirit of life has set us free from the condemnation of the old law. And just like in the book of Esther, you don't have to die anymore. Sin and death have been overcome by the power of Jesus Christ. So God gives us a story of Esther in part to teach us that there's a more powerful law. We have a new law that supersedes the old one, a law that sets us free from our sentence of death. But there's another way that Esther reminds us of the Jesus story, and it's this. We need a mediator before the king who has issued the sentence. So when you're under the sentence of death, like God's people were in the book of Esther, we have no hope unless someone can stand before the judge, before the king, and argue our case. That's why we need a mediator. But we also need a mediator who can stand in both camps, in the camp of the king's court and in our camp. And that's Esther, right? I mean, she can stand and represent the people under the death sentence because she herself is Jewish. But on the other hand, she also has a standing in the court as queen, and the people don't have that. She's uniquely positioned to stand in both camps, the perfect advocate. But for us, the gap is even wider. It's between us and God, between the creator and his creation. It's a gap so large that no human being can bridge it. This is why our mediator can't merely be human. We need someone who's also God. He must be both. The mediator has to have a foot in both camps, and that's Jesus, the only God-man. To ever exist. Paul in 1 Timothy 2 reminds us that this is what Jesus says. He says, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Something else to keep in mind, Jesus is not just like Esther here, he's better than Esther. Whereas Esther was kind of half-hearted at first in her identification with God's people until the last moment, Jesus fully identifies with us. He fully identifies with us in our humanity. He shared our nerve endings, our, t our temptations, our pain, even took upon himself our sin. Jesus is the mediator who totally and completely gets us because he is us. Another way we see Christ in Esther is the gallows versus the cross. Here's how the book of Esther describes it. Having a pole set up, that's the gallows, reaching to a height of 50 cubits and asked the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Now, gallows in those days were not like what you and I conceive of gallows today. When we think of gallows, we think of people being hung by a rope. But the gallows that Haman constructed was a wooden contraption on which people were impaled. They were hung on it like what's on the cross. You see, Esther tricked Haman. She made him think he was being successful in his plans to kill his enemy, kill her uncle Mordecai, only to destroy him with his own gallows. This is precisely what Jesus did to his enemy, the devil. 
God used the schemes of his enemies to defeat his enemies. Let me explain. You know, I've been told all my life that when Jesus came, he only came to set up a kingdom in the hearts of men, that Israel expected a conquering king, and Jesus just wasn't going to be that kind of king. I no longer think that's true. Jesus is a conquering king. What he didn't do was use the weapons of our warfare, because Jesus doesn't need swords and shields, chariots and foot soldiers to win the war that he's waging. He doesn't have to mount a horse or charge into battle to defeat Rome. Jesus doesn't need tanks or smart bombs to defeat the enemy. That's not the Jesus way. You see, Roman had the power of the legions, the sword to keep conquered peoples under control. But they had something else, too, a tool of terror, a secret weapon, a threat so vile that it was enough to keep most insurrections in check. And that secret weapon was called a cross. They invented this form of torture. It was a particularly violent, unusually cruel, and shameful form of capital punishment. It was Rome's public service announcement that said, act like this person did, and this is how you'll end up. The cross was used as public humiliation. It was always positioned in places that assured maximum visibility, because that's the true power of this weapon. Crucifixion was not just done to terrorize the victims, but the entire population. Victims were left on display days after they were dead as warnings to others who might attempt dissent. It's interesting, the word excruciating literally means out of crucifying. It's a word we use to describe what's gruesome and exceedingly painful. It was the worst way imaginable to die. It was used on any and all those who defy the empires. It was terrorism, pure and simple. But Jesus, Jesus takes the cross. He takes the strongest weapon in the enemy's arsenal, something meant to instill fear in every heart and abject obedience in the empire, and he turns it against the empire. Jesus went to the heart of the empire and took their most hated tool of terrorism and turned it into a symbol of salvation. In this way, he rendered the cross impotent. But not just that. Satan thought he defeated Jesus on the cross but he had no idea he just signed his own death warrant. When Jesus died on Good Friday, Satan thought he'd won, only to realize later the cross was Satan's greatest defeat. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but in some church traditions on the Sunday after Easter, they celebrate what they call Holy Humor Sunday. I actually love this idea. The tradition began in the early 1200s, and on the Sunday after Easter, Everybody in the church tells jokes. Even the priests do. The the tradition began because at Easter, God pulled the greatest cosmic joke on Satan ever told. Satan thought he won on Friday when Jesus was crucified. But God got the last laugh on Easter Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. Just like a joke where you don't see the punchline coming, Satan didn't see God's punchline coming at all. In fact, Paul makes the same point in 1 Corinthians 2. Listen to this. We do speak wisdom from those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, a lot of commentators believe that the rulers of this age is referring to people like Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas and Herod and the Sanhedrin. But Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, describes Satan as the god of this world. And he calls demons the rulers of the world, rulers of this darkness. I personally think that the rulers of this age that Paul is referring to are actually the demonic forces. So Paul says of them, if they would have understood God's plan at all, they wouldn't have crucified Christ. Because Satan didn't realize in killing Christ that just like that God had promised to Eve, the seed of the woman would rise up and crush that serpent's head. Satan just didn't understand the plan of God. Just like Haman built his gallows for his enemy only to be hung on them himself, that's exactly what Satan does to himself when he kills the Son of God on the cross. Haman thought he was winning when he was just being defeated. Satan thought he was winning when he was only being defeated. Easter Esther story is Jesus' story. It's the Easter story. But there's one more thing I want to point out, and that is the third day motif. This is about resurrection truth. 
This is what Esther said. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther fasts for three days and nights. Those were days of darkness, fear, wondering what would lie ahead. Will I live or will I die? But on the third day, she appears before the king in her royal robe. This is a beautiful picture of the resurrection, by the way. The third day is the day that people are set free from the sentence of death. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the Bible has next to nothing to say about the second day or the fourth day or the fifth or the sixth for that matter. Yet there are 14 references in Scripture to the third day, many of which are very significant events. Why? Well, because they're all pictures of Jesus Christ and how in, in, in the future he would be resurrected on the third day. So throughout Scripture, the third day is always the day of release. It's the day of good news. It's the day that the evil guy loses and good wins. In Genesis, Abraham was told to offer his one and only son as a sacrifice to God. But the Bible says this, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. So for two days, Abraham is headed to Mount Moriah to do the thing that God has asked him to do. It's a dark journey. It's filled with questions and all sorts of fear. But on the third day, God provides another sacrifice, the lamb that's caught in the thicket. Joseph, when he was in prison, remember what he said to Pharaoh's cupbearer? He said, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your job. What's the message? Well, in three days, deliverance comes and you'll be released. When the Israelites arrive at Sinai, God says, consecrate the people and make them ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down. On the morning of the third day, it will come to pass. So the third day is the day that God shows up. When Jonah is swallowed, is in the belly of the great fish. Remember how many days he's in there? Three days. The third day is the day of deliverance. Again and again, we read this message in the Old Testament. Right now, things are messed up. Right now, hope seems all but gone. Right now, our hearts are disappointed, but a better day is coming. In the book of Hosea, the prophet says this, Come, let us return to the Lord. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us so that we might live in his presence. So when Esther risked her life going to see the king unannounced and unrequested, she said, If I perish, I perish. But on the third day, the golden scepter is extended to her, and she finds favor instead of death. This once again is a picture of Christ going through death and being raised to new life on the third day. Resurrection truth is right there in the pages of Esther. That's why God wanted this story to be constantly retold and celebrated. It's why he wanted his people to never forget this truth. It's why every year during the Feast of Purim, which is celebrated just days before Easter, the Jewish people tell themselves a story of a woman who defeated an undefeatable law, who was made an intercessor for her people because she was both Jewish and royalty, a woman who turned the enemy's scheme against himself, and someone who prevailed on the third day. All of this in hopes that one day his people would make the connection between Esther and Jesus, because Christ has come, and he died, and all hope seemed lost. There were two days filled with dread and fear, but on the third day Christ arose with a message of hope. Death has been defeated, the grave does not get the last word. Life is more powerful than death. Sin has been overcome and you can be free. You don't have to die anymore. The law of sin and death has been superseded by the law of life in Jesus Christ. That's the message of the book of Esther. Would you pray with me now? Father, I just want to thank you that we find Jesus' story, his story in all history. As we read these books and we hear these tales in the Old Testament, 
we read them through a Christocentric filter. We look at them through Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we see remarkable truth where you keep showing your people again and again what you will one day do ultimately in the person of Jesus Christ when he comes and gives his life a ransom for many, dies on the cross, raises again, supersedes the old law of sin and death with the law of life and love in Jesus. God, I thank you for that miracle. And I pray that if there's anyone who's listening to me today, who maybe for the first time is just marveling like I do so often when I read your scripture that you've been telling this story over and over and over again because you don't want your people to miss out on the greatest story ever told, that Jesus loves us. He became one with us. He stands with one foot in humanity and one foot in divinity. And because he is the God-man, He stands as our advocate. He died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. He rose on the third day to prove once and for all he was the unique son of God and able to live in our lives today. If someone doesn't know you, help them to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I want you in my life. I certainly don't understand it all, but I do understand enough to know that you love me pretty incredibly to take my place, to take upon yourself all of my fouled up choices, all of my selfishness, all of my wrongdoing, to carry all that on the cross, to die in my place, to supersede the law of sin and death by replacing it with the law of life in Christ. I want that life. I want to know what it means to be forgiven. I want to know what it means to live with you at the center of my life. So as best I know how, I give you my life. Everything about my life, I surrender to you. I ask you to do in through and for me what I cannot do for myself. Help me to grow now as a Christian. Help me to lean into this more and help me to learn to love you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this series. Next week, we're beginning a brand new series just in time for Easter. Four parts. We're talking about how Jesus ruins funerals. We're going to be talking about the resurrection miracles in the Gospels, culminating with the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. You don't want to miss this series. As always, if this message has been meaningful to you, please like it on social media, share it on social media. If you have any prayer needs or any requests, please let us know about those things. You can let us know in the comments. You can email us at info at springcreekchurch.org. We love to hear from you, especially our online congregation. Anytime that you can make a contribution, we're all for it. So God bless you. I hope it's a great week.